That's right. This is Marty, take one. Soft sticks. My name is Martin Tankliff, and I was wrongfully incarcerated and served 6,338 days in New York State prisons. I remember we were rushing, and I remember like, can you slow down a little bit? And they're like, why? I was like, don't you understand? It's like my first few steps of freedom. And they're like, oh, right. So they, nobody really kind of got it. It was just chaos. So what were you feeling? Disbelief that it really wasn't real. Um, even days today, I find it hard to rationalize that this is real, like, I'm out. I remember there was a lot of good food, and I also got my email address that day, and I learned how to use a cell phone that day. <laughs> I mean, there's also the strange ones, like walking to a supermarket and going to the cereal aisle and just being disoriented, because in prison we were exposed to three boxes, like three flavors of cereals, and walking to a supermarket and there's an entire aisle. It's, in some ways it's a kidney candy store of all the choices, but it's overwhelming beyond belief. I don't know if we will ever feel normal. Um, you know, everybody says, you know, don't you feel normal? There's a yes and a no to that. Um, I don't think I could ever get away from my past. It's always going to be part of me. It will always affect me in some way. I'll be in a room and somebody will be like, well, you know, that's Marty Tankliff who said 17 years in prison. They're like, no way. That didn't happen. That, he's like, they say he's too normal. And you know, then you say, well, what does too normal mean? They said, well, he's functioning, he's working, he's going to school, he can integrate, he can order a meal, he can order a drink, he can drive, he can take the train. It's, but it's still a struggle. I mean, I look at myself as 41, and I, quite often I compare myself to other 41-year-olds, and I feel there's a level of disconnect. 80% of the time I spent time in the law library and it just became second nature and I kind of had this belief that who better to advocate for the wrongfully convicted than somebody like me who really knows the system from inside and out. And I can do so much more good for people being either a public speaker and a lawyer than I can if I went to some other profession. Because of my background, the law firm where I work um, has given me the opportunity to set up a prisoner's rights litigation group. Because I'm not a lawyer, I can't really do all the stuff that I hopefully will be able to do in about a year and a half. So I work with all the lawyers at the firm and we represent individuals who are in prison. Who better to really litigate or deal with prison-related issues than somebody who spent as much time in prison as I did? I want to be, I want to be a criminal defense lawyer. I will take the bar exam in 2014. So knock on wood, 2014 will be a very good year. To me, nobody should suffer like I've suffered and many others have suffered. And what better way to essentially prevent that from happening than setting up a clinic at a law school where the students can have the opportunity to get involved in a case early on in their legal careers and maybe before they graduate, see an innocent person walk out of jail. Our system isn't about convictions, it's about justice. You can go back to, there's an old case from about 1930s, Burger versus United States, that the duty of a prosecutor is to seek justice, not merely convictions. It's also in the ethical rules that all lawyers must follow in New York State. So when a prosecutor has this position where it's a get a conviction, get a conviction, no it's not. It's investigate, charge the right person, and if evidence comes out why that person is charged, that they actually are innocent, well they should do the right thing. I was charged with the murder of my mother and the attempted murder of my father. And it was within a day of me being granted bail, my father passed away. I went shopping the night before, and I went to bed that night thinking the next day would be normal. It was my first day of school. Unfortunately, I woke up and it wasn't normal. Um, the first thing I noticed were lights on in my house, the house wasn't locked up, and I ended up walking through my house and discovered my father who was covered in blood. I called 911 and from then I performed first aid on my father and I remember finding my mother in her bedroom. And it was right about that point that the police showed up. 
And from there, I was kind of just isolated from everybody. Well, my sister's husband showed up that morning, and it was kind of the family member, and I remember the cops separating us. I remember at one point when I was being spoken to and questioned by detectives, my Uncle Mike showed up at the house. He never saw me, I saw him, and he was intercepted by law enforcement. He just drove away. Every time somebody I knew showed up, I was, they were, like, left me there. So it was this low feeling of abandonment. Eventually, I was told we were leaving that house because my father was alive and he was being taken to the hospital. And I was forced to go with one of the detectives. And instead of going to the hospital, I was brought to police headquarters where I was interrogated. You just don't, it's hard to rationalize that this is real. You know, you, you, nobody could ever imagine this could happen to them. Nobody would ever think that you'd wake up and find your parents attacking your own home. But it did happen to me. There were certain lies made to me. During the interrogation process, I was told that they had my hair in my mother's hands. It was a lie. They said they did a humidity test. It was a lie. The coup de grace lie was during the interrogation, while Detective McCready and Ryan were in the room, Ryan was sitting next to me, McCready left the room, left the door open, and he did what we've always called the fake phone call. He called another phone in the homicide squad and said something to the effect, Jimmy, I don't remember who he said, oh, Jimmy, that's great, really, really? That's great that he's alive, that's great that he's talking. And he came back and said, Marty, we, we, you know, they pumped your father full of adrenaline, and he said, you did the murders, and just tell us you did the murders. I remember saying to them, so I'll take a polygraph. Like, I didn't do anything, I'll take a polygraph. But that's not what they wanted to hear. There is a written confession statement that was handwritten in Detective McCready's handwriting. And the first time I ever saw that was at the Huntley hearing, which was eight months later. But that day, they had the ability to electronically record the interrogation. They had the ability to get a stenographer, and they chose not to. So for 17 and a half years, it was, this is what I say happened, this is what they said that happened. How much would it have cost to record the interrogation, even back in 1988. You had video cameras, you had audio cameras. You know, they, they come up with this theory that it's too costly to record interviews and interrogations, or they say, we don't want the suspects to know what you're doing. I've said, if you're not doing anything wrong, you should not be afraid to have the interview and interrogation recorded. When they say it's too costly, What's more costly, recording an interview interrogation or letting somebody innocent suffer in prison for 10, 15, 20 years? Are you telling me that I can't set up a little webcam connected to a laptop and record for 6, 10, 12 hours? You really, what cost factor is there involved here? People find it very difficult to understand why you would ever admit to a crime you didn't commit. And one of my lawyers kind of simplified it for people. If you remember when you were a kid and your parents went out and everybody was home and somebody broke something, and your parents came home and said, who broke the lamp? Until we know who broke the lamp, we're not going out for ice cream. How often do you think the person who didn't break the lamp said, I did it because they wanted to go out for ice cream? They just confessed to a crime they didn't commit. It's as simple as that. And in the criminal justice world, it's on a much bigger playing field. There was a professor that I know who said, the innocent are more likely to confess to crimes they didn't commit because they have more of a belief in the system. He told me about a case where a man who was bald, who had no hair, was being interrogated, and the cops told him, so listen, we have your hair at the crime scene. Tell us you killed this person. So in his mind, he's thinking, well, I'm bald. There's no way they could have my hair. He confessed to that crime thinking, technology, there's no way. But he confessed to a murder he didn't commit. It's not uncommon. When I try to describe to some people kind of what prison is like or a prison cell is like, I said, find a bathroom that's about six by nine, that's got a tub in it, a sink, a toilet, and think of the tub as your bed. I said, stay in there for 24 hours. And allow somebody to let you out of there. 
the core of it is freedom of choice, freedom of movement. You know, then it goes to your family, your loved ones. I mean, I went to prison when I was 19, so my youth was lost. I always used to tell people that I'm residing here, I don't live here. And people said, what the hell do you mean by that? And I said, well, physically I'm here, mentally I'm not here, because I always knew I would never die there. And every day I did something to fight to get out of prison. For years and years, I'd write letter after letter after letter after letter, and probably wrote over 50,000 letters. And I remember there were times that, even when I had some of the greatest lawyers around, I'd still write to people. And I remember when I'd mail these letters out, you know, guys in the law library would see me with a stack of you know, 100 letters, and they're like, Marty, you, know, you have the dream team, what are you writing? I'm like, I'm still here with you, aren't I? And they'd be like, yes, yeah. so why would I stop writing letters? I said, I'm still here with you. Recently I spoke somewhere and I said, you know, it was, you know, it was in there with rapists, robbers, murderers, and thieves. I said, and those were just the correction officers. But, you know, it really was that environment. But then you were there with people who were innocent. You were there with people who made one bad choice in life. I made friends in prison. I'm still friendly with them today. They're out. Almost every one of them are out. And we still go out together because we survived the unsurvivable. We survived, you know, hell. People would say to me, how could you tell who were innocent in prison and who weren't? Because they say, well, doesn't everybody say they're innocent? They don't, they really don't. It's probably 80, 90% of the people who say, yeah, I'm guilty, I'm in prison, I'm guilty, I pled guilty, I committed a crime. I've always said the, the innocent people in prison are defined by their actions, not their words. The guys who were innocent were in that law library as much as they could. They were, you know, writing to people. They were researching the law. They were, they were, they were willing to do anything. And I used to have my three little question litmus test. Number one, are you willing to do a DNA test if it's available? The answer I want is yes, almost instantaneously. Are you willing to take a polygraph test? I want to hear yes. Are you willing to do any other forensic test that's available that can help prove your innocence? Yes. I'm looking for that, you know, by looking the person in the eyes. They're innocent. They're willing to do anything. 